Hey, deserving listeners, it's time to continue our journey with Mika and Michael on Married at First Sight. Let's see what happens, and I will react to it. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. I've been both those things for over 20 years, and I often have a lot of things to say, so let's get to it. My mother gave me up when I was nine months uh, to my aunt, and so I think all of it's kind of helped shape a lot of how I think about the world, and um, especially when it comes to the work that I do, why I put passion so much into the children, because I think all of that kind of ties into my story and um, it helped inform how I move in the space. So that's interesting. It's always great to learn about their history. He said he was adopted at nine months. Sometimes that has an effect on your attachment. Sometimes it doesn't. Maybe we'll find out. Even down to like how I think about intimacy. Hey, do you, 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 you understand that? I mean, I think I need an example just so I can understand exactly what he's talking about. Please. The reason why my love languages are the way they are is not intimacy based on the idea of sex. It's the idea that like those things are important to me because being adopted, you're missing that kind of motherly affection. So it's very important to me to like have that closeness in that space. And it doesn't mean sex. It's just I want to feel close and vulnerable with a person that I'm intentionally spending time with. He really, really wants to have motherly affection. And I'm guessing he's saying he wants that from his wife. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's, we get a lot of our needs met from our spouses. Motherly and fatherly love can be part of what we seek. We obviously don't want that sort of love all the time. We want also mutual love um, as well. There's nothing wrong with, I'm going to take care of you right now and you take care of me later. And then we take care of each other. It's totally, totally okay. And par for the course for a good marriage. So he's being very vulnerable about that, which is fantastic. I wonder where that comes from from him, and I'm glad that the Reverend is, is getting more details about this. I wonder if Michael knows this based on his history that he was given up for adoption, at his words, at, at nine months, which can be an attachment disruption. A lot of people say like, well, nine months, it's like you can't remember it. It, it affects you uh, empirically. When a child doesn't have consistent attachment figures, particularly past six months, four months, six months, then there usually is some kind of negative effect from that separation from someone that you've bonded to. It gives it this impression to the child that people can just disappear. It also gives the impression that maybe they're not good enough for people to stick around. It doesn't always happen, but it often does. And then he said he was adopted by his aunt. Sometimes, not always, when people adopt in a situation like that in the family, I've seen this clinically, where the aunt will be very loving and very caring, but not as loving and as caring as a mother should be or a parent should be. And I don't know about his, you know, about the other caregivers in his life at that time. So you might be in a situation where as the aunt, you're just like, well, I don't really want, I'm not really wanting another child in my house, but I don't want my nephew to be thrown into the foster care system. So sure, I'll take him. But the aunt might not have been fully on board. I have no idea, but I have seen that before. And it wouldn't be unusual, right? Where you're just like, yeah, I'll, I'll take on that kid, but you're not as invested as you would have been necessarily if it was your biological child that you decided to have. This isn't always the case, but I've seen this before. And that could compound one's longing and deficit of parental love that Michael might be looking for. And we'll just, we'll just see what Michael says. Do you understand? I get what he's saying, but he has said other things that contradict what he just said. And it's hard for me to trust him. Michael just said something really vulnerable. And then she says, I don't know if I can trust that. That's not going to help Michael to be vulnerable. There's nothing wrong with her having that feeling, but I wish she would have empathized with his vulnerability in that moment and, and validated it. It's like, oh, thank you for sharing that with me. I, I want to be that person for you. Let me talk about something else. It doesn't really match up with something that I heard earlier. Now, I will say that the Reverend right now, I really like his style. He's, he's being a very effective couples therapist in this moment. He's asking the tough questions. Uh, he's getting them to feel safe to reveal and to have these tough conversations. He's asking the other person, how do you feel about that? that that's, you know, that's, those are all good techniques. 
I actually want to go back and watch Michael being vulnerable and then seeing uh, Mika's response to that. The reason why my love languages are the way they are is not intimacy based on the idea of sex. It's the idea that like those things are important to me because being adopted, you're missing that kind of motherly affection. So it's very important to me to like have that closeness in that space. And it doesn't mean sex. It's just I want to feel close and vulnerable with a person that I'm intentionally spending time with. Do you understand? I get what he's saying, but he has said other things that contradict what he just said. And it's hard for me to trust him. If I was the Reverend right now, I'd be like, okay, great, Mika. It's, let's talk about that. But let's slow down. I want you to hear what Michael just said, because that's an important, vulnerable thing he just said that I think he really wants you to understand. So can you reflect to Michael what you just heard? And then we can get to the inconsistencies that, that you've seen and the concerns that you have. What is it that you don't trust? I don't trust that he's telling the truth sometimes. That's like the basis of it. Sometimes when he Why? says stuff to me, because he's like lied about stuff in the past. Like what? He swore up and down. He never told me that we had to have sex during the honeymoon or he wouldn't be, want to be in a marriage. Did you say that? No. Oh. He Talk said those exact words to me. They, they edit this. I have no idea, but it looks like Michael was being very vulnerable and very healthy of just like, I was adopted. I didn't have a lot of motherly love. And really what I, I wish he would have been a little bit more specific and because it sounded like what he was saying was, yeah, sex is important to me, but really more importantly, it's physical affection, that sort of, cl that warmth and closeness that I'm looking for. And if you don't want to do that, Mika, that's fine. But that's really what I was talking about more when we were talking on the airplane or on the honeymoon of wanting to have sex. It was more like really longing because I, I know my own needs. I really need that kind of cuddling and physical warmth from, from people that really is important to me. It sounded like maybe he was getting at that, but he didn't really emphasize that enough. But he did basically say it. I, at least that's what I heard him say. And now we're into this other kind of conversation. Now, if he did lie, then Mika does deserve to have some explanation there. And if he did lie, then he could say something like, yeah, I did lie about that. Um, so here's what happened for me, you know, and, and give an explanation. If I was the Reverend right now, again, I would try to slow him down. And because right now I think I'm losing Michael. If I was the therapist, I'd be like, I'm losing Michael. He's never going to come back to my office again. I've been in a couple sessions like this before where one of the members is vulnerable. They kind of get slammed down. Things don't go well. They feel ganged up on. And right now in Michael's head, I bet you anything, he's like, this is such a big mistake. Get me out of this. I want out of this right now. This feels very uncomfortable. And that's not a place that you want to be in. There, as I always say, there's usually reasons why people exhibit behaviors like lying or other kinds of things. And so instead of just slamming someone and saying, you're a bad person, there's something wrong with you and shaming them, you know, let, let's try to understand it. So hopefully the Reverend can turn this around. And this is the problem that he won't admit that he said it, and he did. Did you say that? I did not. What did you say? There was a conversation about like what that looked like on the honeymoon, like there's a general thought or expectation, right? That the, the word expectation was said, but it was not, I need this to happen or else. And that's the frustration. That's not what he said. Okay, well, what, what, what is it, Mika? He literally said, we need to have sex during the honeymoon or I'm not gonna wanna be in this marriage. I want him to be honest. This is the root of the issue is that. <laughs> so you see the Reverend frustrated. Couples therapy is the most counter-transferential form of therapy that exists. I, I'm very comfortable in saying that, meaning that when you treat couples, you have the most emotional reactivity as a therapist. It's, it creates the most distress for you as a therapist, the most feelings of incompetence that you feel as a therapist, the most anger, the most frustration, the most despair you're going to feel as a therapist is with couples. Individual therapy is so much easier. Group therapy might be a close second to couples therapy. Family therapy is probably also a close second, but couples therapy is so counter-transferential. I've been doing couples therapy for 26 years, for four years. And so I have gotten to a place where I don't have that much reactivity or when I do, I am pretty aware of it right away and 
am able to differentiate myself. But for novice therapists, meaning the first 10 years of your career, the countertransferential feelings can be overwhelming. And right now, if you're watching this scene, it even if you're not in the room, you kind of feel that tension, right? And the reverend is feeling that too. Because right now you have him saying, I didn't lie. That's not what I said. And she's like, yes. And you hear her voice kind of escalating. He seems like he's kind of sinking. The reverend is like, what do I do with this? It, who's telling the truth? I can't tell what's happening here. How do I get them to you know, see eye to eye? It seems like an intractable situation. She's saying he lied. He's saying he did it. She's saying he said this thing. He's saying I didn't say that thing. What do you do? Well, what you do as a couples therapist is you say, okay, this is, there's a million things you could do, but here's what I might say in this situation. I might say, okay, so let, let's slow down. Uh, Mika, let's talk about more of the full context of the conversation that you remember. Let's, you know, try to, let's take a deep breath. Our memory isn't going to be f facilitated if we're very distressed. So I want you to go back and tell me the full conversation, Mika, from your standpoint, okay? And then there probably would be more context there. You know, she said, he, well, he said that, okay, well, what, what was said before that? How did, how did you get to that point? And then help her to kind of go back there and probably see that it wasn't like he just sat down and said, you're going to have sex with me or else. Like that's the way she is basically saying it. And help her to understand uh, that it was within a context, or maybe it wasn't, maybe it was a worse context, but just getting some more context. Then I would ask him, okay, what do you remember? Get some more, get him to talk about what, what he remembers. Maybe even help him to admit, yeah, I might have said something along the lines of that, but that isn't really what I meant. Okay, so then you get him to relax and then you say something like this, this is what I say. So I'm gonna tell the two of you that I've worked with couples for 24 years and this is a very common conflict where two people remember the same event differently. And I, as a couples therapist in the beginning of my career, I was always trying to figure out, well, who's right? What, what, what really happened? Well, as time went on, I learned there's no way for me to know because our brains are emotional. We have emotional memories. They're not factual memories. And it's very changeable memories based on how we feel and our narrative and things that happen afterwards. So... Either one of you could be right, and both of you could be wrong, and both of you could be right. It's just hard to know. The fact is, is Mika, you remember him saying that. So, and Michael, you don't remember saying that. And it sounds like, Michael, what you're saying is that wouldn't it be something that you would say? You believe like, no, not only did I not say that, but that doesn't really sound like something I'd say because it wouldn't, I wouldn't have said it that way. But Mika, that memory is in your head and you deserve to have an apology. And so Michael, can you apologize to Mika for at least giving her the impression that that's what you meant, even though that's not what you meant? Let's try to mend this right now. Mika can probably cannot move forward until that is resolved, until you show that you care about what memory is in her head. And Michael, try to put aside defensiveness. Maybe you did say it, Michael. There's no, none of us are going to know unless someone had a tape recorder going at the time, which you guys didn't. So Michael, can you, can you apologize for what you think probably did happen, which is you gave her the impression that that's what you were saying at the very least. Can you apologize for that? And then Michael said, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm really, I'm sorry. And then, then I would, some people apologize in really, uh, sort of weak ways, <laughs> ineffective ways. And so I'd really try to get, cause I don't think Mika can move forward until she understands that Michael is really sorry and doesn't agree with that statement and agrees that maybe he did say that, like there's some apology there. But Michael has to feel supported and able to, to do that. And that comes from the therapist. So let's see what happens. I feel like I can't trust him because he won't even admit that he said it, whether that's how he meant it or not. Like he can say like, I said it, but that's not how I meant it. Michael, did you say it? No, I said expectation. That's what I said. Here's the thing. The only thing to get over a lie is the truth and more truth and more truth. And over time, that truth will outweigh anything that you may have perceived was a lie in the past on both sides. For you, you're feeling like, you know, I can't trust him, I can't trust him, I can't trust him. But if you've seen more positive than you've seen negative, then I'm going to challenge you to lean on the positive. So 
I, th- I think that's good. As I always like the Reverend, he uses his charisma and his body, and he's not just a stiff board. He's, you know, he's get, getting into the mix of it, which is, I think, the hallmark of, a, of an effective couples therapist. He's not doing what I would have done, but as I said, there's a million different things that would be effective. And what he's saying to her is, look, you got to look at the the whole picture. It sounds like he did do something that you don't like, but have you seen him do other things that are consistent with that? You have to look at all the good and maybe there's some bad things in there. And she seems to be on board with that. I don't know if that's going to work though, because in their phone session, when they're on their honeymoon, that was essentially his message to her. She clearly has not moved on from that. It clearly was very hurtful to her and maybe even traumatic to her. She might have traumatic sexual history where she was forced to have sex with people and now she's married to someone who is giving that vibe. So I don't know. There's no way for me to know unless, you know, I was able to talk to her. So I I don't suspect that just telling her to take the good with the bad is going to work for her. For you, you're feeling like, you know, I can't trust him, I can't trust him, I can't trust him. But if you've seen more positive than you've seen negative, then I'm going to challenge you to lean on the positive. Okay, and Michael, what are you feeling now? Because I'm not, I didn't come here for y'all to be in a worse situation than you were when I got here. So he's saying, I didn't come here for you to be in a worse situation than when I got here. And it basically puts uh, this pressure on the, on the couple to say like, oh no, no, you're doing a great job even though they might not really be feeling it. Another question you could ask in this situation is like, I'm sorry, did I mess up by asking you these questions? Just ask the client, just be like, did I, did I make a mistake? That can really help build the bond between you and the client. Because we were supposed to be moving forward. For me, I wanted to make the marriage work 100%. So as we can see, I think, Michael has shut down. He is being called a liar once again by his wife. Maybe he did, maybe he is lying, but he, it appears he doesn't think he lied. And he is shutting down. He's retreating. He might be making plans to get out of this marriage as soon as possible. This isn't a good place to be. So when I see this, I, I really lean in to the Michaels on my couch and I really say like, what's going on for you right now? How are you feeling? And, and really try to bond with them and really try to make them feel safe and, and supported for their emotional state. What's going on, man? I need to know what's going on with you, Mike. Mm-hmm. Talk to me, Mike. I need you to tell Mika what's going on inside of you. Please. Why are you crying? Come on, this is your turn. This is your opportunity. I need you to talk to him. So, thumbs up to the Reverend again. (laughs) Excellent instinct there. Lean into Michael. And then Michael has feelings that want to be into the in the room they start coming in the room now he he's trying to motivate michael to to say where those feelings are coming from which is fantastic kudos to michael for letting the emotion into the room fantastic a lot of men have a hard time doing this and it is incredibly unhealthy to suppress that kind of emotion in in the moment it makes sense i'm guessing he's going to say I feel like I'm attacked. I feel like my wife feel thinks that I'm some sort of sex crazed maniac and that really hurts my feelings. Let's see what he says. Just feel like I'm failing. Tell her what you're saying. Um for me in general, like you it's a lot of pressure that I put on myself that we put on ourselves to be everything for everybody. (laughs) We're in a very unique, unorthodox situation and it's hard because I'm trying very hard to make this work. I really am. I didn't come here to fail. Great job, Michael. I would want to know more about that, though. He, he, he tends to talk in this very logical manner. And I would try to get past that and just be like, What's, what feelings are you having right now? What, it, where in your body does it feel right now? Is it hurt? Is it anger? Is it sadness? Is it disgust? Is it jealousy? What is the emotion? 
okay, tell me more about that emotion. Why do you feel that emotion? You know, instead of he, he likes to speak in a very intellectual way, which isn't necessarily reflective of what's happening for him right now and doesn't give Mika a, an opportunity to, to understand his heart and take care of him. That was the first time that I saw my husband cry. And honestly, in the moment, I felt sad for him that he's sad and like clearly he's going through something right now in his, in his head that like he has to let that out. For me, a successful marriage is a one where both parties are happy. So very sweet of Mika. I'm, I'm glad that she's saying that. I, I would hope that she could say it right there, but she's but that's what's in her heart and that's wonderful. So I just want him to feel comfortable with sharing it and being open because I think this is what a healthy marriage looks like. I feel like we definitely have issues, but I wouldn't say that we're failing. Like, that we just have issues that we're trying to work through. But I don't look at it as we're failing in the marriage. So that's great. That's probably helpful. Uh, you're, Mika's really going for the crux of the matter in terms of what he's describing. Now, I will say that maybe this feeling of failure is a schema of his that he incurred from his early childhood experiences for one reason or another, the adoption, who knows. But this feeling of, I am a failure. He, it could be an intellectualization of a deeper feeling, but if we go with that, some people walk around with a schema. Some of, the, some of you people out there probably have that schema as well. The schema of when things go wrong, it's because I am a failure. Not I failed or I did some, or I made a mistake. It's I am a mistake. I am a failure. Ooh, that's interesting. I am a mistake being, you know, adopted out. When you believe that you're a failure, nothing can really touch that. People can say, no, you're, you're a success and, and you can even have success. But deep down, you just believe, no, 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 I... It's a given, I am a failure. So I wonder if this experience is triggering that, that schema for him. Mm, okay. So very good impulse by Mika to hug. I wish she would have hugged him longer, honestly. And I wish Michael could have said, thank you for hugging me, keep hugging me. And that was honestly the first time I saw him cry like he, always like presents himself as like tough and like, you know, stuff doesn't really bother him as much. But the fact that Pastor Cal was like able to get it out of him, like makes me feel a lot better. For me, this was like the first time that I felt like this was genuine without a question. And so that meant a lot to me that he like cares so much and that he knows that like he can be vulnerable around me. Yay, yay, Mika, Michael, Mika, Michael. That is awesome. So she appreciates his vulnerability. She feels closer to him. She probably feels warm, warmth towards him. That is wonderful. A big part of falling in love is vulnerability and someone taking care of you. Vulnerability, taking care, vulnerability, taking care. And they did that and that's great. I'd like to see Michael be even more vulnerable because it, it seems like there's a lot of feelings down there that are waiting to come out. And kudos to Mika for seeing through that. Uh, sometimes people will pathologize male tears. They'll be like, oh, he's weak. What's wrong with him? He's damaged goods, whatever. Uh, he hasn't, you know, he hasn't grown up yet. He's a child. Uh, Mika had none of that, which is just fantastic. Last night for me was very hard. But like, I've learned a lot um, about myself, about you, about everything. Thank very highly of you. And I do believe there's something here. Is there anything I can do to help kind of put us back on track? I want to feel secure. I want to feel validated. I want to be in a happy and loving marriage. And I just want to feel like, like no matter what, I know I can trust my partner above all else. I can respect that. I uh, appreciate you being honest and transparent with me. I want you to be able to feel comfortable with me. And please understand that I'm always gonna have your best interests at heart. Nor would I ever put you in a situation where it's me first and you second. So I'm trying to figure out Michael here because if I was to look at his you know, his body language, he, he, he seems kind of 
hunched over and he is not is almost no eye contact. He also really falls on his own sword a lot. He just said said something along the lines of I will always put your needs before mine. No. <laughs> you should never put someone else's needs before it should be a mutual like we both have needs and let's both pri- let's let's not put one person above the other. So he has this way of talking where it's I don't and it's very calculated not like he's some psychopath, but what I'm getting at is that there is this thing called avoidant attachment, and it usually involves lack of eye contact, meaning that when we're young, we're nine months old, 12 months old, um, you know, and, and around that age, if we're not getting enough love and attention and enough attunement, then we might decide, you know what, I can't really depend on other people, I give up, I'm going to avoid attachments because it, it hurts too much to depend on other people. And one of the side effects sometimes is a lack of eye contact and actually research shows this. Do you want this marriage to work? Yes. Hey, me too. And often for those people with avoidant attachment, there's a deep, deep longing for someone to come across the boundaries and the walls that they put up and reach them and take care of them. So he's talked about that a little bit too. And I hope that the two of them can provide that for each other. All right. Well, that does it for another episode of Psychology in Seattle in which I react to Married at First Sight. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.